Okay, everyone. Uh, so, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Good news first, okay. So the good news is I'm gonna make the final open book, open note, open internet, because it's just too much work to not to, to proctor. Um, Cause there's like 20 of you that are gonna be taking it remotely. So, and I'm not about to figure out how to do that. <laughs> I don't have the time. Um, so that's the good news. And if you're taking it in person, um, you can bring your computer as well if you want. You can, uh, uh, and you'll also have access to me like in person, uh, which is probably nice. Um, I'll, I'll be monitoring Zoom. Adam will also be monitoring Zoom for any questions during the exam. Um, Yeah, and if you come in person, I'll like have paper copies of the exam for you. If you aren't in person, you're gonna have to do that yourself. So just just be aware. And also, I guess this is there's two good bits of good news. Like, okay, so I, I said I said last time, you know, please email me if you're going to be in person or remote. That still stands, unless uh, don't email me if I if you're if uh, if you are going to be here in person, basically. Only email me if you're gonna be remote. And a lot of you have done that already. If you're gonna be here in person, I'll just, I'm gonna assume that everyone who hasn't emailed me will be here in person. And so that's how we'll roll and I'll make enough copies of the exam uh, accordingly. Um, but if you aren't, just let me know. There's not, it's not gonna be like, that big of a deal. Um, I just need to know whether or not you're going to be here or not. Okay. Um, I don't think it'll be the same Zoom link because I need to like figure out some stuff with permissions because I don't want you guys to be able to like post messages to each other. So that would be bad. That kind of de defeat the whole purpose of the exam. So. I'll have to figure that out and I'll send out a Zoom link. I took, I'm taking Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off from work, mainly because I need to do stuff for this class. So um, I will figure it out then, and, you know, we'll, we'll go, go with that. Um, okay, so that's the good news. So the bad news is because it's gonna be open, everything, it's gonna be hard. So um, I highly recommend you use sort of good test taking practices. Maybe don't go through it front to back, go ahead and skip questions if you don't know. Um, I, I don't necessarily, I haven't written it, but I, I'm not going to write it such that um, I think that everyone will finish it. So I think that some people will be able to finish the entire exam, but um, I don't expect everyone to. So if you're like, if you don't answer a question, that's not going to be the end of the world because um, yeah, I, I, if, if, thing, if the distribution's bad enough, then I'll curve it. This one's timed, yeah. So um, it is seven to nine on Friday p.m. Not a.m. That'd be. I mean, I'm not even awake then. Uh, harder than the midterm. Well, there's going to be more stuff on it, and it's going to be longer because it's two hour period. So there's that. Um, I, oh, I also posted on, on P 
piazza um, a, a, a list. I pen, I think I pen this of final exam topics. So you can look at that and start reviewing. Um, but I, I I didn't I didn't spend a whole lot of time going through that list. It might it may change slightly um, before Wednesday, but I, I don't think it'll be any any less than than what's on that list. I will also say in general, if you're trying to focus on what trying to figure out what to focus on, focus on things that haven't been on an exam already. Because I'm probably not going to ask you the same question again. In fact, I, I definitely won't answer, ask you the same questions again, especially the ones that were really bad questions that I hated grading and just gave you all 100% on anyways. Okay, I think that's enough. We can talk about it uh, later as well. Um, and we'll obviously have all of Wednesday to review. But I want to finish up uh, cash coherence. So let's remember back to what we're trying to, to accomplish. Um, the problem that we have is that when we have a cache and we do a few loads into two different caches, and then we write to a cache, now we have data that's out of sync. We have sources of truth that are wrong. And so we need to have some sort of a way of determining, uh, of telling the other processors, hey, uh, we've updated this. We need some sort of communication between the, the, two, the two different processors um, across this interconnection network. And um, there's two main methods. And this is, I think, where we, where we kind of ended. There's a Snoopy bus, which is where each of the processors kind of looks at all the other processors to see which um, read and writes they're doing. And then if it sees a write on a different processor for a cache line that it, it has as well, then it will go ahead and invalidate its copy. Um, the other option is this directory option where um, we basically are gonna keep a, a dictionary of sorts. Uh, it's gonna be a, a fancy data structure that keeps track of which caches have each block. And then the directory is going to be how we coordinate which processors need to be invalidated. Um, I, I'm going to kind of, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, so we'll, we'll skip the details for now. Okay, so let's talk about this Snoopy cache coherence first. And this is kind of what we've already seen already um, with, the, with the two different, two state valid invalid um, uh, state diagram that we saw last week. So the the fundamental idea is that we're going to snoop um, all of the caches are going to snoop on each other, and uh, that's how we're going to generate coherence. That's how we're going to make sure that we don't ever have two sources of truth. Um, we also need to store some metadata with all of our cache lines to indicate whether or not um, uh, it's, you know, valid or invalid, or we're going to see in just a little bit that there can be more states as well. Um, and so the advantage is that it's, it's pretty easy to implement this if you have a shared bus. If you're able to send messages to all of the other processors um, across this uh, this bus, this shared bus, um, that's great. You're, you're going to be just fine. Um, and you know, even up to you know 32, 64, it's not that big of a deal to send messages. You know, it, it 
it, it does, however, if you get up to, you know, a very, very um, uh, large number of cores, might start to give you problems, right? Now you sort of have this n squared problem where you're having to send messages to all the other processors. And it just becomes really annoying um, and potentially uh, has pretty high latency. Or if you're able to reduce latency, you're still going to have to use a bunch of hardware to send all those messages around. So a lot of your processors are going to be taken up by that. So um, like I said, small scale multiprocessors, ones that you're kind of going to encounter in the wild are going to be just fine. Okay. So let's look at what this looks like. So we have our two processors up here. Well, I guess there's n processors, but let's just say that there's only two. Say n is two because that's easy. Um, cache has the data here, C1 and Cn. And then this thing on the side is our state bits. This is what we're storing to determine whether or not the the cache line is valid or invalid, or we're going to see in a little bit. There's some other different uh, metadata ideas that we can we can have as well. And whenever, for example, say cache one does a write, it'll send out a, across the bus that it's written to that line, and all of the other processors will be snooping to do. do on on this shared bus and we'll go ahead and invalidate or do whatever the action required by the the protocol is so we looked a little bit at this last week as well but uh, the convention is going to be that we have pr which is processor read so this is whatever happens when a processor say p1 does read into uh, its cache. Uh, PW, I know it looks like an R, that's kind of a typo, except for it's written, whatever. Um, that's a processor write. So we're now, instead of reading into cache, we're, we're writing something to the cache. Then we have bus actions to a block. So say that C1 goes ahead and does a write and sends across the shared bus that uh, it's done a write, that's this BW. Somebody's said, oh, hey, I'm, I've written to this. So, so now um, we, we go ahead and we'll figure out what we need to do when we do a, a bus, when we see a bus write. And we are also going to see that bus reads are also in some protocols broadcast across the bus because that's necessary as well. Okay. So let's revisit this really simple protocol that we discussed last week where we have two different states, just valid and invalid. And uh, the caches are just going to um, snoop each on each other, and there's only really one one thing that matters. It's this bus write um, event that, that that matters on the bus. We still send the bus read just for completeness' sake, and uh, um, whenever we see a, a write on the bus for this cache line. We'll go ahead and invalidate our own copy. Okay. And whenever we do a, uh, if we're already valid and we're just doing a bunch of writes, that's going to be fine. We'll, we won't have to invalidate anything there. Okay. Any questions on this protocol before we move on? Because there's, we have to, we're going to talk about some problems with it and, and some additions to it that'll, that'll help us solve those problems. How do you know if a bus write will transition you from valid to valid or valid to invalid? 
so you mean like uh well there's only one edge that's a bus right it's this one isn't there that loop on top of valid that ah yeah so okay so great question yeah so this is meaning that if we see a processor right then we're going to take this edge and also the thing that's after the slash is the action that we're going to send across the bus more or less so this is what the processor would send hey i did a a processor right so i have to send across the bus so this is like a part of the, of what has to happen if you do a processor right it's not that this edge is processor right or bus right it's that this is the action that will be sent on the bus does that make sense yeah so they aren't really equivalent no these are not like you know uh these are not indicating that both of these actions would make this loop happen it's that this is the this is the observed action this is the uh this is always whatever what we send across the bus yeah good good question any other questions Okay, so one of the main problems with this is that um, there, there's sort of this um, a, a annoying thing, right, where, where we um, don't really know if a cache line is shared or not. So why might that help? If, if we know that we have the only copy of a cache line in, the, in our cache, we can just write to it at will. We never have to send any bus writes either. So we can reduce bus congestion. So if we knew that we're the only valid copy, when we do a write, we don't need to send anything over the bus. That's just pointless because none of the other processors would need to know that. They're all like, we don't have this cache line. Why did you send this to us? So if we can figure out a way of, of getting rid of that, that bus write message, if, we only, if there's only one cache that has a copy of this data, that'll be nice, right? Uh, the bus is honestly you know, a very, that, that's one of the um, bottlenecks and in cache coherence. So if we can reduce the number of messages that we're sending across it, that's a net win. So that's where we get this slightly more sophisticated protocol. Two states wasn't enough. Let's add a new state. Okay. Um, the first state that we is kind of the same, this invalid state. So this just means that it's not in the cache okay so that one's easy we all kind of understand what invalid means but now instead of valid we have two different states we have shared and modified so shared is going to mean that uh this cache line is potentially one of several cached copies okay this means that maybe processor a and processor b both have this line in their cache. Then we also have modified. Modified means that this is the only cache copy and it's also dirty. So we, we've done some write to it and now it's the only copy. And so if, if any other processor tries to read, it'll have to you know, get that data from our, our cache line. Okay, so um, if we have a read miss in a processor, uh, that read request goes out on the bus, 
And then we've transitioned to the shared state. Okay, so that means that uh, we did a read, it wasn't there. Now we're going to um, uh, be in a shared state. This may be a copy, uh, this may be one of many copies that are in the different caches. Um, and then if we do have a write miss, so this is where we wrote write to a line that we don't have in our cache, we're going to do a read exclusive request, and that's going to transition us to an M state, meaning modified. So we've modified this cache line. Um, and when a processor sees one of these read exclusives, that's what the EX means, uh, request from another writer, it has to invalidate its own copy. Okay, so you can also transition from SM um, uh, without having to, to go out to memory because you already have it in, in memory. Uh, you can move from S to M just by invalidating all the other caches. So let's see what this state diagram looks like. Okay, so now we have three states. Invalid is the first state. If we do a read, uh, we're going to send a bus read across the bus. Um, and uh, we move to shared. Now, if we see a bus read, is there the, uh, there, there's a few states where we will do something about it. Um, if we're in modified and we, we see a bus read, we're going to flush our data. So if we've modified it and then we, another processor is wanting to write or wanting to read, sorry, um, that data, we're going to have to flush our, our data out to the bus and out to, out to memory. Um, and then the processor will be able to get the most up-to-date information from, from that cache. Um, and if we're already in shared state, then we'll just stay here. We have a clean copy that hasn't been modified by us, so we don't have to um, do anything. We always start in the M state. No, we always start in the in the I state. Um, well, I okay. I mean, yeah. You you always start with the cache line being not present. So if you then have a write. Um, if you don't have it in your cache, but then you you write to it, then you are going to do a processor write and send across a bus read exclusive. And if you ever see a bus read exclusive, so for example here, you have this edge down down at the bottom. Bus read exclusive makes us go from shared to invalid. So now, if we if there was a uh, um, an exclusive read on the bus then we're always going to end up in this invalid state if we're a different processor. Um, likewise, up here, if we're in modified state and we, there's a bus read exclusive, we, we also have to flush. So not only do we have to write the data, uh, or sorry, invalidate our own cache line, we also have to flush the data out to memory. A few things to note, uh, just, you know, Anything coming out of the M state, we always have to flush, right? Because it's been modified. Therefore, we always have to flush that data out so that other processors can know about it if we ever leave this state. Um, if we're in modified state, we can just keep doing as many reads and writes as we want because we're the only copy. If you have the only copy, there's no need to tell any of the other processors, hey, you know, uh, this data is being written to. We don't have any uh, any action on the bus in these cases. Um, uh, 
whenever we do a write, we're going to end up here. So whether we're an invalid or in shared, we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to transition over to modified whenever we do a write. And then again, we do this bus read exclusive out here. And in shared state, the, the condition for staying in shared state is just if we do keep doing reads. If all the processors are just reading the data, not, it's not going to affect anything. No, nobody will have to invalidate. We're just going to be in this perpetual shared state. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much it. Um, any, any questions about this particular protocol? Oh, and by the way, this is called the MSI protocol because the three states are M, S, and I. Can you go over exactly what the states are again? Yeah, so, so I is invalid. S is shared, meaning that the copy in this cache may be one of many copies. M, which is the modified state, meaning that this is an exclusive copy. We are the only one that has this. And it's also dirty. So we've, we've done some modification to it. That makes sense. So let's think about again, why did we have to make this modification? What have we changed? What has this given us that the other simpler protocol didn't? Yeah. Yeah, we can just continue reading and writing without worrying about sending anything across the bus. Yeah, so that's exactly what it is. Um, that's the advantage. Now, um, would we ever see a bus read exclusive in M state if it is exclusively ours? Yeah, so um, the, the case would be that another processor that's currently in the I state does a write to that cache line. And what happens if, if it's a write, then it becomes the M one, you know, it, it'll move to modified. And it'll also send this bus read exclusive out across the bus. So then whoever used to be modified, again, remember the each, there, there's one of these, you know, state machines for each cache line in each cache. So, you know, um, when we when we get this bus read exclusive, we're going to have to flush. You know, the other processor is going to have to flush the data out and also transition itself to I as well. Okay, yeah, great questions. So, what's the is is there anything in this that you feel like maybe we can, you know, avoid? Is, is there is there any Part of this that seems inefficient. Maybe we're sending another event across the bus. We have a few different state transitions where it could be one. Any? How is bus read X different than bus read? So bus read X means bus read exclusive. It basically means that there was a a processor write to that cache line on a different processor. I don't know why it's called bus read exclusive when it's really that there was a write, but whatever. Um, yeah, so any any ideas of where we can might find inefficiencies and, and be able to get rid of them? Instead of going from, instead of M going to I, it could go to S during bus read X. Could it go to S during bus read X? No. So let's think about this. Say we have 
uh, our two processors, right? And um, there's a bus read exclusive that comes uh, across. Um, uh, say processor A is in M state and processor B is this, this I state and processor B does a, re a write. So it sends this bus read exclusive. Okay, so now it's in the modified state. The modified state guarantees that that's the only copy in any cache. So if we uh, on processor A went to shared instead of invalid, then that wouldn't that condition wouldn't be met. It would be in this S state, and processor A would be like, "Oh, it's valid. I'll just keep pulling from this, even though processor B that did the processor right is is uh, overridden the value." If a processor knows it will modify data it's reading, it can go straight to M and skip the S state. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, that's that's on the right direction. It's definitely this transition to the M state that we're going to be kind of targeting. Um, and in particular, um, if we know already, if we're in the shared state and we know already that we're the only copy, then when we transition to the M state, uh, we don't have to send a bus read exclusive across the bus. There's no need for that. And that's where this next protocol comes in. Um, yeah, this, this slide kind of talks about this problem. So, To begin with, everything's invalid, right? No cache has it. But in this MSI uh, protocol, when we read, we're immediately going to shared state, even though it's the only copy, or it may be the only copy of that cache line in any cache. So, um, you know, the first cache access, right? We're still going to go to shared, even though most likely this is this is exclusive it's exclusive to this processor it's, there's only one so this but it's not dirty either right so we don't really want to put it here because then that would be annoying we have to then do this flush operation so the key is we're going to add a new state um yeah and in this in this MSI uh, protocol, if we're in the shared state, going back up here, and we're the only processor that has the data, when we do it right, we're still going to have to send this bus read exclusive across. That's what this is saying. It needs to broadcast this and validate, even though it only has it has the only cached copy, right? Um, so it'd be nice if we kind of knew that we're the only cached copy across all of the processes, right? If we have exclusive access to it, but it's not dirty. Um, and if we do that, if we know that, then we avoid this bus message which again bus messages are expensive and really are quite a bit of a bottleneck okay so let's look at the solution the solution is messy um not Lionel, not your kitchen the the protocol diagram so uh We're going to add a new state for exclusive. So, so what the state means is that it's the only cache copy and it's clean. So let's go back oh, oops, up here and remember that this modified is, it is the only cache copy, 
but it's dirty. Okay, so that that's the difference. Um, one of these, the M state is dirty. The E state, exclusive state, is clean. So there's been no writes. We wouldn't have to flush it out back to memory in, in a write back situation. Yeah. So the new state and the M state are basically the same thing with the exception of that. Yes, the M state and this new E state are basically the same, except for this dirty versus clean. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. So, okay. So let's let's um, go back down here and, and talk a little bit more in detail about what the ramifications are. So, um, oops. Is it a new state or a state of M? It is a new state. Um, sorry. There you go. Okay, so um, the key is that we're going to place our the block into this exclusive state when we do a bus read if no other cache had it. So back up here, see how we did whenever we do a processor read from invalid, we go to shared, even if there's only one copy. Okay, so the difference is now we go to this exclusive state if there if there is no other copy that is. Um, now, this check requires some additional logic. The snooping caches have to kind of give some indication of like, oh yeah, I don't have that in my cache, you're fine. So we're, we have a little bit more back and forth there. But now when we go and write to an exclusive block, we can just transition straight to modify. We don't have to send any message across the bus because we're the only copy. Uh, and we've already asserted that fact. So messy is also called the Barcelona, I mean, Illinois protocol. Um, and uh, you can read about it in this paper. So let's look at a state diagram. Oh, oops. Let's not look at the state diagram quite yet. There's there's a a bit of um, it's it's basically the same, right? We still have our processor read, processor write, um, but now there's two different bus write events that are going to be sent across the bus, bus invalidate, which just says, hey, invalidate your data. I already have a copy, but you need to get rid of yours. And then bus, I think it's read invalidate. This is invalidate, but you also need to send me the data. So this would be like, uh, if you're, um, need, if, um, the invalidate also needs to provide uh, the data. And that's, that's what this BRI is indicating. And again, we've discussed the four different states. So let's look at the state diagram. It's gonna take us a little while because it's a bit more complicated. Okay, so. First of all, let's look at the, the states that exist. For we have our invalid state, exclusive clean, exclusive modified, and then shared clean. Okay. Notice that we never um, have shared modified. 
that would be pretty bad if we had that, right? It would mean that two different processors um, would have different data, right? You can't be shared and modified at the same time. Okay, which processor sends the data if it, if it is shared data? So, find, uh, yeah, so say that um, we do a write from an invalid state, from an invalid state, and then we go to, that goes to exclusive modified. That's when we send this BRI across the bus. And in this case, the, um, whichever, whichever processor used to be in the exclusive modified state or in the exclusive clean state uh, then um, in that case we would need to uh, supply the the data um, to the other processor so whoever is in the exclusive clean or exclusive modified state, that's the processor that will need to send the data to the new processor that is in that uh, exclusive modified state. Does so that make sense, Ethan? Cool. Yeah, so it, it's always the processor that has the most up-to-date value that needs to send the data over to the new processor that is gonna do something with that, with that data. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the edges now. So the first difference um, between, between this messy state machine and the MSI state machine is that when we do a processor read, um, and it's only for that process, only that processor, that, that, that processor is the only one that has a copy of it now. Um, then we're going to go to this exclusive uh, clean state. Um, we also are going to have this uh, BR. So we send a bus read on the bus. Um, which will which will allow us to um, get the data. And from the exclusive clean state, we can just read continually because we're the only copy. Notice that's the same thing down here. You can just read continually here in any exclusive state. But the other thing that you can do is uh, from exclusive clean, you can transition over to exclusive modified without sending anything across the bus. If you do a write, well, now you go from exclusive clean to exclusive modified, exclusive dirty. And how do you know another processor doesn't already have the data when you first read it? Great question. So that's gonna require additional bus traffic to, to ascertain whether or not you're the only copy. Um, that, that was mentioned up here. Uh, snooping caches have to assert the signal if they have, uh, um, if they also have a copy. That make cool. Okay, what else is interesting here? Okay, so what happens then if others have it? So, so now instead of there being one condition just the pr now we have two conditions whether or not it's pr and then also you know the um whether or not there's exclusivity so if others if other processors have it then we're going to send a br across the bus and now we're in shared clean so and, and if we at any time see a br say we're an exclusive clean now we're going to have to transition over to shared because now there's two copies 
And whenever there's multiple copies, it's no longer exclusive. So we have to go to shared. Um, and notice here that in this exclusive clean state, if we're in exclusive clean and then we see a bus read, we also have to supply the data across the bus to the new processor. So now that processor doesn't have to go out to memory. It can just pull it from the other processor that has the data. Um, likewise, you know, we can have as many as we want in shared clean as long as they're just reading. And whenever we see a processor read, we're going to just loop back around. If we see a bus read, we're just going to send the data for that, uh, that cache line over to the new processor that is joining the shared state, shared clean party. Um, okay. If we're in exclusive modified and we have a bus read, we do the same thing um, where uh, when we see a bus read, we're going to supply the data. So we just go over to the shared, shared clean state. So it used to be exclusive. Now it's shared. And um, we can, bo both of the processors will have the same data because it was supplied by the processor that had the modified copy. Okay, um, I think I'm still a little confused about the BR and the shared state, which one of the processors sends data to the new shared processor or is it just random? Um, so BR in the shared state, um, if we see a B, BR, the, the really the only case where that would happen is this transition here, I think. Yeah. Um, and the, the supply data, since it's on the right side of the slash, means that that processor will send that data to the new processor that just requested it um, via this BR. And uh, didn't the one who sends BR on the wire already get the data from memory? No, no. So, uh, well, okay. That, that's a that's a good question. The the base. So let me go back up here. <laughs> Um, okay, I don't remember where which slide it was, but um, I'll just use this example. The bus is going to have it's going to be kind of a little bit smart, where um, the cache is going to always just request the bus, "Hey, give me data." If you know if it can pull it from a different processor, then that's great. You know if it if it was in shared state or something on a different processor, then it'll it'll just service it from a different processor. Otherwise, then it will go out to memory. So it's the processor that sends the BR has not necessarily gotten that data from memory yet. In fact, definitely hasn't. Um, the BR just says, hey, I need this data. Give it to me somehow. Don't care how. And if there's another processor that's in shared state or in exclusive clean state or exclusive modified state, then it will be the one that supplies the data. Otherwise, it'll just be supplied from memory. Um, Now, uh, a few things to, to remember. Whenever we do a PW, we're going to end up in this exclusive modified state, right? PW from shared, PW from invalid, PW from exclusive clean. Anytime we write, we have to go to this exclusive modified state. Um, anytime that there are multiple copies of the same cache line, we have to be in this shared clean state. 
So you can kind of just remember like, okay, if other, if you're trying to figure out, oh, I can't remember what, which ed, what does this edge do? Well, just remember if for it to be in the state, there has to be more than one copy. So this one has to be the, the case that there's other processors with, with the data. Also here, right? We go from exclusive modified over to supplying the data and now we're shared. Um, and I, I think it's useful to think about all of these. Um, you know, the other thing to consider here is this, this um, uh, BI, which again is this bus invalidate message. Uh, whenever we go from shared to exclusive modified, now we have to go and say, hey, invalidate all the other copies, right? But we don't have to get the data supplied to us, right? We already have the data. We were already in shared. So we don't need the data. We just need everyone else just to get rid of their copy. Okay, maybe you don't like this state diagram. You can use this one instead if you want. I don't know, Pixie makes everything look like it's professional, I guess. Um, this is the same, same thing, except a few of this, the edges are not labeled. Oh, actually, no, there is a label here. Um, I, I, I think both of the, the, the diagrams have their, their advantage advantages. But one thing that I think that this really shows is that whenever we do, uh, there's a bus read exclusive. So uh, then we have to flush and, and go to the invalid state. Um, oops. And um, the bus read exclusive uh, is is what happens when we write from uh, either invalid or exclusive here. Okay. Uh, so that's that's the equivalent of what is in over here. Okay. Um, sorry. This bi, I think. Yeah. Um, and then again, this is highlighted for a reason. The, if we go from exclusive to modified, we don't have to send anything across the bus. We can just do it because we can. But if ever there's a bus read, then we have to go from exclusive to shared. Now we're not the only copy. And whenever we do a write, we're gonna have to send out this bus read exclusive to flush and invalidate all of the other ones that are in that shared state. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so um there's also problems with messy um the, the big one is that uh the share state requires the data to be clean right there's no way to have shared dirty um so what if um we need to write so, so sorry let me let me restate the, the fundamental problem with that is that we have to write that block to memory um when a bus read happens when our block is in our modified state so let's go we're in modified. So we're in this state here. And uh, we do a bus read. Ooh, 
bus read? Oh, sorry, bus read here. We have to flush that out to memory. So that's going to potentially cause unnecessary thrash in memory um, because maybe maybe you're just in some sort of loop where you're doing bus read, bus write, and kind of going swapping between these two states across two different processors, trying to write the same data. That's totally reasonable. So um, we'll add another state. Uh, what we'll do is not transition from M to S on bus read. Um, instead, we'll just invalidate the copy, supply the modified block to the requested process to the processor that's requesting the data. Um, and we won't send that out to memory. So uh, we kind of just swap the, the data around between the different caches and never send it out across the memory controller to uh, the memory. And um, what we'll kind of do is have this notion of an owner, this O state, um, where that owner is the one that when, when that cache line gets evicted, that'll be the one that, that actually writes to memory. This will help avoid having pro, uh, issues of, um, like I said, it'll avoid having to, to write to memory as, as much across our bus. And that's gonna save potentially some amount of bandwidth. Okay, so uh, this is called the MOESI protocol. Notice you just keep adding letters and that's how you make new protocols. Um, we aren't going to talk too much about this, but I just wanted you to be aware of this. Um, and I wouldn't, yeah, it's not gonna be on the test. So, um, okay. So any questions before we move on to directory-based cache coherence very briefly? So, oh, oops, that was the wrong direction. That's the right direction. So directory-based cache coherence, now instead of, um, instead of each cache sort of keeping track of the other caches and watching them, uh, we're gonna have a centrally located directory um, that's gonna keep track of where the copies of each of the different cache blocks are, right? Or which caches they are in. And each of the caches is gonna have to consult the directory to make sure that coherence is maintained. Okay, so each cache block in the memory, we're gonna to have to store P plus one bits in the directory. So one bit for each cache, indicating whether the block is in the cache. Okay, so if we have four processors, we're gonna have four bits that just indicate whether or not that processor has a copy of that cache block. Oops. Then we have the exclusive bit. This is gonna to indicate to us um, that a cache has an exclusive copy of the block and can update it without notifying others, okay? Uh, so on read, we're just going to be able to um, set that bit, one of, these, one of these first P bits corresponding to that cache uh, to one, and then we figure out who needs to send the data. On write, we invalidate all caches that have the block and reset their bits to zero, except for the one that has, is doing the right. You know, it'll stay exclusive um, and it, it doesn't have to be invalidated. And when we do this invalidation, we have to also uh, go and, and tell the caches to invalidate themselves. Okay, so let's just take a look and, and see what, oh, 
by the way, so this exclusive bed is, is nice because again, exclusivity allows you to just keep writing for forever without notifying anybody of what you're doing. So um, here's a, an example of a directory based theme. At the beginning, uh, we just have, nobody has the data. So this is just assuming P is four. So there's four processors. We have an exclusive bit over here as well. Nobody has the data. Now, if P1 does a read, and we're, I guess, I don't know why half of these are zero index, half of these are one index. This one happens to be zero index. So P1 is going to do, have some read miss on block A. Okay, so it, it read block A and then it had to pull it from memory. Okay, so now its bit is set to one. Now, if P3 also does a read miss, has a read miss, um, then its bit will be set to one. And um, we can also use this directory to know which processor needs to send the data. So we would tell, hey, processor one, send data to processor three. For example, now P2. Oh, and by the way, so one other thing: neither of these are exclusive, right? There's this is not an exclusive copy in either of these cases. Now P2 uh, has a a write miss. A few things need to happen. First of all, we need to look over here and be like, oh, we got to invalidate P1. P3, so that's the first step. Then um, um, P2 is going to have its bit set to one and it's now exclusive. It's the only copy. And P2 can just do whatever it wants. It can read, write, just have a, have a great time modifying this cache block. Um, And P2 is also going to have, you know, in addition to the directory having this exclusive bit, P2 is also going to have an exclusive bit on this cache line to indicate, hey, this is in fact exclusive. Um, and it doesn't have to consult the, the directory and uh, to, to make sure that it is exclusive. Now, if P3 has a write miss, then the memory controller is going to request the block from P2, right? It already it knows, hey, it's here. The bus is just going to be like, hey, go ahead and send your data, whatever your current data is, send it over to P3. And uh, P2 is going to invalidate its copy. So that's the other thing here. And we have to update the directory accordingly. Um, in this state, we are exclusive, right? There's only one copy, so we're fine. We can, we're, we're gonna be okay. And then if P2 has, goes back and wants to read again, for example, now it's no longer exclusive. There's multiple copies, but what we can do is we don't have to go out to, we don't have to flush this. We don't have to go out to memory. All we have to do is say, hey, there's, there's a copy of this data here in P3. It's exclusive. So P3, send your data to P2, whatever it is. We don't have to send it back out to memory and bring it back in. We can just move shuffle data across our inner process bus, inner processor bus, and get the data that we need. Okay. So that's a very simple example of a a directory based system. Any questions on that? Will they need a dirty bit to remember to write it to memory when it goes from X to several processors having it? So the dirty bit. I believe will just be on the cache line itself. Yeah, so, so when it gets evicted, then it'll be written. Because, you know, uh, 
I guess the other the other thing that we don't have here is an indicator of owner. So you could extend this and make it more like the MOESI protocol and have some some notion of who would be the one that would write the evicted copy, but we'll 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 leave it here for now. Um, okay, so Let's just talk briefly about some advantages and disadvantages of each of these. Back. Different uh, methodologies. So Snoopy Cash, Cash um, has some pretty big advantages. The miss latency is pretty short. Um, when we do a request, we can, it's just a bus transa uh, transaction straight to memory. Right, we don't have to go and consult a directory. That's the pro that's one of the main uh, disadvantages of the directory method. We have to go and do the request and then go look at the directory and then out to memory. Um, in Snoopy caches, global serialization is pretty easy as well because we already have the bus, which is controlling who goes first. It's also pretty um, easy to implement. Most processors already have a bus to do something with anyway, whether it's locks and other, other things across the bus. Um, so the, the disadvantage is that we do have to broadcast to all caches and they have to be seen by all caches in the same order. So there has to be some serialization on this bus you know, and that's not really scalable to many, many processors. Um, and and you sort of need this this idea that all of your that your bus is entirely ordered. You have a total order on your bus, or else you're going to have major problems with correctness. Um, on the other hand, the directory method, we already talked about one of the main disadvantages that we do have to go and consult this directory, but the directory itself is also gonna take extra space to keep track of, of who's sharing what, right? This isn't free. We have to store it somewhere. Um, and in, in, in a lot of cases, we can actually approximate this instead of storing them precisely. We can just say, uh, we can be okay with false positives, i.e. we can be okay with thinking that some processor has the data when it doesn't. What we, what we cannot do is, is have a, a situation where we think that the processor doesn't have the data, but it does. And it's like keeping on reading from it. That would be a bad situation. If we don't know about it to tell it to invalidate itself, for example. And there's all sorts of, you know, the protocols become more complex. There's race conditions that happen on the directory itself. So that's gonna be a, annoying as well. Um, but the advantage fundamentally is that we get rid of all these broadcast messages that are really annoying. And um, it's going to not be bottlenecked as much on, on, this, on this bus. The, the scalability is really on the, the interconnect and, and the directory storage. Okay. So any questions? So last couple slides, false sharing. So, um, parallelism, you know, everyone's like, oh, you should, Parallelism is great. That'll just give you great improvements. Um, but let's just, you know, think about our expectation, right? So our expectation is, you know, this program that used to be about 80 seconds. Now it's about 40 seconds if we double the number of threads. If we go up to four threads, now it's down to 20, right? And it just kind of goes down 
um, every single processor that we add, right? Um, so that's our expectation. And say that we have this parallel program, right? Where we have some number of threads and we sort of just spawn and do this, do this uh, increment thing on, on the different threads, right? Pretty simple. We're allocating different threads to doing different parts of the increment. I, I won't dive too much into details about this code. It's not too important. So the reality though is that we actually see the exact opposite. Our performance doesn't go, our, our runtime doesn't go down, it actually goes up. Why is this the case? Well, the problem is that we have this, this false sharing on this increment. So what does false sharing imply? So the basic idea is that we're accessing, we're actually accessing the same cache line from all our different processors at once. And they're all, you know, conflicting and having to deal with this cache coherence. So now, uh, before, with, with a single processor, there's no cache coherence penalty. But when we go to two processors, now they're fighting over the same cache line. And they're invalidating each other and messing each other up, pun intended. Um, so we really see that the 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 fact that these two cache lines are 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 sorry, these two processors are sharing a cache line can really really affect the performance. So let's let's just look at uh, sort of a a another view of this. So say that we have a memory, it's really small, there's 12 spots, but a cache line is four of the slots, okay? And we say, you know, pull it into thread one, it does an update to this part of the cache block, our cache line, but then thread two is like, oh, I wanna, I wanna do something on this one, oops. Um, I, or on this, this part of the cache line. So it sends an invalidate over here. And we're just like going back and forth between each of these, invalidating each other, flushing stuff out to memory. Again, something that has more latency. Um, and we are kind of like, effectively we're interleaving these, these accesses to the same cache line. So we're flushing stuff out to memory, flushing stuff out to memory, invalidating each other, running on top of each other. Um, and so this is something to be aware of when you're doing parallel programming. Oftentimes it's, it's actually advantageous to just go ahead and give yourself additional just blank space just so that your cache lines align so that you don't have this situation so that you are guaranteed that thread two and thread one are going to be operating on two different cache lines. So if you have a struct that is maybe only three fourths of a cache line long, you'll just pad it with an extra bit of zeros just to make sure that you never have this problem. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think it's pretty interesting that how, uh, how a lot of, how, how sometimes you have to make a trade off of, of space for the hardware itself, right? That's an actual programmer is gonna have to figure that out. And, uh, allocate the, the memory accordingly. Okay, that is it for the content of this course. Um, thank you all. I just wanna say uh, you guys have been great. I've really appreciated, especially the people on Zoom. Um, I know it's, it's hard being remote um, and I really appreciate that you have continued to engage during lectures, thank you to the people who show up to class as well. It's nice to not have nobody here, um, if not too many normally, but um, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that I have been able to uh, give you some real insight into computer architecture and that I've done justice to this course. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll review on Wednesday and I'll see you, see you then. Oh, and office hours tonight. Yep, thank you all. Hey, so
Sumner? Yeah. Um, uh, do you think, uh, I know you normally have office hours on Friday since you switched them from Wednesday. Do you think this week you might be available just in case for like last minute questions I'll after the review? available on Thursday. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I'll post something about that um, in an email or something. I'll make sure to also do that, uh, remind you on Wednesday.